Your support helps us bring you programs you love. Go to wyomingpbs.org, click on support, and become a sustaining member or an annual member. It's easy and secure. Thank you. As all farmers know, you can have good years and you can have bad years. We're like, how in the hell do we pay for this? I've watched this business become so concentrated, uh, very efficient. You know, we got a really efficient system and very cheap. Good Lord, meat's cheap. The prices have gone nothing but up for the packer, but for the cattle rancher, I mean, maybe a slow, steady rise, but nothing to keep the branches in business. This commodity system that America's created as a small rancher, it doesn't work. What if we could maintain control of the product throughout its cycle, from birth to plate, basically, and work toward a real product that is indicative of Wyoming and let Wyoming get the credit for it? If you create a model that's better and still put some food on the table, then it'll just take over naturally. And it's like people like, won't resist it. It just happens. Beef to Butcher on this Farm to Fork Wyoming. Funding for Farm to Fork Wyoming is provided by viewers like you. Thank you. In the concentration and specialization of the meat industry, the first one to fall was the chickens. And it hadn't been that long ago. I mean, that was between the First and Second World Wars. Everybody had farm flocks. There was chickens everywhere. So it was a little local kind of a, a, a meat economy. And what Tyson did was start buying those chickens and, and he had a place that would process them at close to a major city. And so he got bigger and then he got bigger and then he started contracting chickens and then he bought the chicken houses and then he would supply them with the baby chicks and then he would supply them with the feed and pretty soon he was totally integrated. He bought the processing place and he marketed it himself and he had the trucks that run him around. So it went from all these thousands, tens of thousands of small flocks to a more concentrated, more concentrated until now there's, what, two or three companies that own about all the chicken and egg things in these huge houses and it's, it's, it's very, very efficient. And that's why eggs and chicken are very, very cheap. So that was the first one to fall. Then the pigs came and pigs could be worked on the same way. And so of course we did it to the extremes. Pigs got very cheap. And now the bulk of the pork that is the United States is, I think it's Smithfield now, which is a Chinese owned company. So we've gone from tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of pig producers to a couple. And the cattle thing happened too, and I was a part of that because when I started buying cattle, tons and tons and tons of small producers, and then those producers got to be bigger and bigger and less and less of them. Then I went to uh, Oklahoma and ran a 25,000 head feedlot that I expanded to 50,000 head, uh, and that's that's big, and that's it. Yeah, it ain't right but it's very, very efficient. And it makes for very consistent beef. And that's why you can go to a Walmart in 48 states, probably 50, and get a steak and it's gonna taste the same everywhere and cheap. So damn cheap that, that, that the rancher, that cow producer is going broke. He's not getting a return for his. And that's where our Wyoming beef is right now because of the system. He's at the mercy of just a handful of, 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 of processors. And they can really just, well, I'll give you this much, and he's got no alternative. Where else is he gonna sell them? It is a political bad time, you know, and it's a, it's a political mess that has been created by a bureaucracy that doesn't understand what rural Wyoming even looks like. And it's like the ranchers are the guys that have three jobs, and then there's the guys that are selling them are the guys with three houses. Like that's, I don't think that's right. And nobody's questioning them. They're just 
Okay, that's what the market is. Well, why is the market like that? It just is. I'm in the Wyoming legislature. When I find something that's popular with my constituents that all of them do or all of them come from, uh, that is a win-win. But where, where, which, which Wyoming, you know, the senator or or Montana senator or New Mexico senator is going to raise a flag and say, I'm here to defend ranchers so that they there can be parity and these ranches stop disappearing from the plains of, of our western states. Why do we do away with country of origin labelings and we allow all this, um, you know, South American and Australian beef to just flood in? You know, it's supply and demand, like we know what that is, but like, why are we doing that? You know, while they're just like, they're chopping down rainforests to make room for more grasslands, it's like, I don't know. I'm guessing it's politics. Farms and ranches are struggling, and customers are also looking for a food system that supports their needs and values. And people in Boulder really have an understanding that you vote with your money, and you vote every day with what you eat. There's a growing interest in the public to have a very transparent a food source that doesn't involve toxic pesticides or herbicides or even commercial fertilizers. And I think on top of that, folks like to know that they're supporting small business. So it's a living circle, an evolving circle that needs to have that education attached to the product that's going through that circle to be transparent and to be sustainable for everybody. They want to know where their food comes from. They want to feel comfortable with it. All ideals that consumers have to be willing to pay for. When my father came back from the Second World War in 1946, he was paying, he told me, 35% of his income for food. Now, uh, I think the latest statistic is under 8% of what we're paying for food. A recent USDA survey showed Americans spent an average of almost 10% of their disposable incomes on food, nearly half of that on eating out. And we are, have had government policies for years and years and years to help cheap, a cheap food policy. It's so easy to get what we consider food, which, I mean, I don't know. I don't know that a lot of the stuff that we're eating these days isn't, I mean, yeah, I mean, it wouldn't qualify as food as much as it would qualify as poison. Where we're at now in the beef marketing spectrum is really a social experiment of whether people will realize that there is enough value in knowing who and how it was produced that they will pay to keep that person on the land. That's where you get back to ranches working with slaughterhouses with friendships and you know transparency and trust and all these old things that are grown in our roots in America. It's like, let's get back to that. Relationships from the ranch to the slaughter and packing plant and the local butcher and food artisan. We would love to see you know some processors within the state of Wyoming. We have so many cattle, but we're shipping them all out. Right now, we got Jared in Hudson and I think he's 90 days out. If you want to get something slaughtered, you better get on the list. And what happens is then people, you know, there is no alternative besides hauling three or 400 miles. And so it's just not economically viable. Why is it so hard to bring animals that we raise on our family's farm to a plate in a restaurant, to a plate in a family's home? You know, why is that so hard? It shouldn't be hard, but it is because of the different restrictions that USDA has put into slaughter. Because USDA policy favors big industry over the small packer, some states have stepped in with their own inspection programs. And we have a lot of, uh, of redundancy in these laws. So there might be ways to, to really uh, help them. So that one good example is what we got in Wyoming right now. If you want to be a butcher and start a slaughterhouse, you can go for a custom exempt status. This ensures that the shop meets basic sanitary standards, but there is no inspector on site. People bring their beef in or, or meat in uh, and the animals are slaughtered 
and, and cut up to their specifications, but it's for their use only. They can't sell it. It's a good basic service, but doesn't allow the product to reach retail and wholesale markets. The next step in then is state inspection. State inspected was set up to be as good as or better than USDA inspected. The difference being if they're USDA inspected, it can go intrastate, over state lines. State inspected, it's got to stay within the state. So if we are indeed as good as or better than USDA, why the devil can't we ship it over state lines? So in order to take our next step, we have to have a change in federal law um, to allow for local butchers to be able to do, essentially count as a USDA qualified butcher. So that's why the the meat thing is not grown. It's just that infrastructure right there. You hit it right on that. We got to get more of those processors. Meanwhile, after decades of struggle, Wyoming may be seeing a change of heart with a series of USDA inspected processors planning to come online. This is the first uh, USDA plant in the state of Wyoming in 45 years. It's the only one that is full slaughter to packaging. With a capacity of 50 animals a week, it's an important step for a number of local ranchers. Now, if they want to get with the program of no, no antibiotics, no hormones, with an all-natural beef, they got a place that they can, they can supply us. And we have several ranchers around doing that, and that's what we need. We need the local, we want to stay local with our cattle, and we want the local ranchers to have a place other than taking them to feedlots, like in Denver or whatever. Uh, we can pay what the feedlots are paying, and it benefits us, it benefits them with their freight. They don't have the, the freighting and everything. You don't find neighborhood butcher shops anymore. It's a, it's a dying trade. It's these humongous plants that they do 2,000 cows a day. This is, this is completely different. We will take the uh, primal off the cow and we will cheesecloth it into something like this. We will end up trimming all the mold off. It's, uh, it's not a bad mold. It's a good mold, it uh, gets tested as well. Time frame so far has been between 30 and 45 days. That's where we've been most successful. At some point we will, we'll perfect it and then we'll fire up our dry aging cooler and then we'll mass produce this stuff. But for now, we're just trying to, we're just playing with it. There's only place around that has aged meat. Uh, you buy hamburger, it's aged, the steaks are aged. That's what we're, we're striving for where rendering plants and big packer infrastructure is lacking, a lot of byproduct ends up in landfills. But skilled shops like Black Belly Market make sure less goes to waste. And so as butchers, not as meat cutters, it's our duty to maximize that whole animal. And the way we do that is with methods and techniques that we've learned over the years from tradition of preserving meats and fabricating meats to make them more appealing for the general public that might not be used to seeing that or be used to consuming it. You know, we go to the organs, obviously. We go, all right, let's talk about liver pastrami's. Let's talk about dry cured pork kidneys. Let's talk about head cheeses. Because ribeyes will sell themselves all day of the week. Tenderloins will sell themselves. So being a craft butcher goes into that whole animal utilization to not only make it edible, but to make it appealing and to make it educational and be able to relay why I, that you should consume this because it's healthy, because you're helping everybody else who doesn't understand that system, you know? Well, butchery for a long time was at the bottom of the social status. You know, they were way down there. But that's rapidly coming up. The people that I have working for me here are more than just butchers. Like, they're awesome human beings with a vision, with emotion and connection. And to actually have a platform and a program to where I can do this and educate a team, um, I feel like it is kind of a little special spot.
And the world of ranching is also about the creative use of resources. It's really hard to write down what a rancher or farmer should do. He's the one that knows the asset that he's got best. And I really think that, that maybe we let the market take care of that, that if that farmer and rancher tells his story and lets the consumer decide which story they like best, they're gonna go with a guy that's doing the best job. In Clark, Wyoming, the Gallaghers run a self-contained corn-finished cattle operation. We run a cow-calf operation and we do do some crops. We have some corn and alfalfa. Everything is born and raised right here on our ranch. And all of the feed, we raise it ourselves. So no antibiotics or hormones. Um, all of the corn that we raise and we feed them is all non-GMO and no pesticides that are used on it either. Anymore, it seems like an ag unless you've inherited the land or unless you maybe have another um, income stream, you have to kind of create one. And so we got into direct marketing our, our beef and our pork. And then the corn maize, that brings in quite a few guests in the fall, helps with the income on the place. The choice of crops and cattle are part of a nutrient cycling strategy. This used to be farm pretty hard out here, um, beets and, and beans and stuff like that. And, and this ground's just really not suited for that type of production. It's, it's a little lighter soil in most places. Um, we feel like the, cow, the cows benefit the ground. So from our standpoint, that manure is pretty valuable. You know, it's, it's a, it replaces commercial fertilizer and commercial fertilizer is not cheap. So, so to us, manure is a pretty valuable nutrient. In fact, I can take a pretty sandy piece of ground. When we first came here and started farming, we had ground that wouldn't, wouldn't really produce anything. And then if the wind blew, it blew away, you know? And we, we've, we've put a lot of manure on that ground, more than just running the cattle on it, actually spreading manure on the ground, cleaning pens and putting it on there. And, and now that that ground is almost as productive as the rest of the place. The alfalfa is probably the crop we rely on the most. Um, and we always follow alfalfa with corn. There is a lot of nitrogen value in alfalfa when you plow it under. So, and corn is a big nitrogen user. So that's kind of why we use corn. Um, that and we have a use for it in our, in our feed. We'll take this grain off of our grain corn and then the cows will be turned out and they'll eat They'll eat the leaves and the husks and some of the stalk. And then about the last four to five months um, before they're harvested, which we usually harvest them anywhere from 18 to 20 months, they're going to be on a, on a corn diet, a dry corn diet, which um, increases the marbling, makes the product a little, well, I wouldn't say a little, I'd say a lot more palatable. You know, it makes, it's what beef is really, I guess. Um, at least that's how we feel. We started at farmer's markets and then the next year we doubled and we've gradually just kind of done that year after year. The sale is the hard part. The, the raising the crop and, and and everything that goes along with raising it, we're already doing that. But to take it to the next step and to sell it, that that's the hard part. And direct sales wouldn't be possible without a good relationship with the small slaughter packer facility. But for this, they've had to go out of state. We have found a great family to work with, still water packing up in Columbus, Montana. Um, and I think that the one thing that we really appreciate about them is uh, the fact that they don't use any chemicals or um, sprays during the butchering process. Everything is just um, controlled by uh, temperature and humidity. So what our butcher offers, it just complements what we do. Um, and it just, it keeps a great product out there. It's a different ball game. It's not, you don't just take it to the elevator and, and sell your truckload of stuff and, and walk away and have no responsibility. We would like to be able to take all of the beef that are born and sell straight to consumer. On the Carter Ranch in Tensleep, RC has been developing an unusual premium market for older grass-finished cows. The grass finish thing was interesting. You know, we were we were gathering a bunch of cows and like looking at them like some of these things, their butts on them look just like these big old fin they look like finished beef. And I grabbed I called my boy Nate Singer, who's uh, from Cody Boy down at Black Belly. And I'm like, how old is it? He's like, it's gotta be seven, eight years old. 
And I was like, all right, bring it back to the ranch. Like, let's, let's finish it out and see what's up. So I took them down and we killed nine. And out of the nine, like 30% of them went prime, which in the commodity grain finished beef industry, I think it's like four to 6% of grain finished animals go prime. And we blew those numbers out of the water. We're like, whoa, what do we got here? You know, and it's all grass, it was all grass fed. And uh, we finished nine. And the next year we did 20, 20 something, not very many the next year. And then we were like, oh my God, like this is something. It really is amazing, you know, to have grass fed that looks like this. You know, it's really special to have marbling within a grass fed carcass is like pretty unheard of. And that's what really gives um, grass fed meat a bad name is that Typically, grass-fed animals are raised, they're trying to raise these animals within like a commodity setting and like they want to they kill them before they're 30 months old. Well, the problem with that is like these animals, like there's not as much carbs, fat in grass to get these animals, you know, to pack it on. And that's why they use corn is like, you can just pump them 20, 25 pounds of corn a day and these things just get fat. But with a cow eating grass, it takes like three times longer. Cattle genetics play an important role in this, which in America have been geared towards a corn finish. And so most grass-fed beef's pretty lean. And people come in and they're like, hey, give me a grass-fed steak. And then they cook it and they like, you know, especially if you ask for like a steak well done, you've blown it. I mean, and so they come in, they cook it and there's no fat in it. So then it's just like this dry hunk of meat and they're not impressed and it like kind of gives it a bad rap. But people that have been trying this stuff are like, whoa, what's that, you know? You can have marbling in grass-fed beef. And with those 20-some, we took them from like two years old up to 12 years old, and we aged them. And we actually figured out our dry age to make them palatable and to make them maximize. Our, our market is what we call the double-aged beef. So they're old, and then we go ahead and age them. They were considered throwaway cows, you know, all these old beef. This old market from, you know, Wyoming, where they have their cow-calf operation, 100% grass-fed on rangeland, most beautiful land in the country. But when they finish producing, they're considered throwaway. They're, they're useless. So now we're kind of upcycling them by taking them and spending another year getting them fat on the grass. We grow our grasses all summer long and it's picked up by a hay crew, piled, and we use it um, to feed our cows in the winter so we don't, um, you know, they can eat the natural native grasses all year round. They inoculate it with uh, some bacteria and so that makes it ferment. And so once it's packed, then it just like sets up, the bacteria does its thing and, uh, you know, you come in in the winter time, it's 20 below and you, Cows get hot lunch. Here's some of the haylage and all the different grasses. And it has a sweet smell, almost almost like molasses. I think it makes a good, nice intestinal flora. These old animals, that's seven years of grass. Like how many pounds of grass has that cow consumed? It's like the knowledge is in that fat. Predominantly they're our, the cows that we raise, but you know, it's like this challenge of like, if you're on a menu in a restaurant, you have to have, you have to supply a steak all the time. We had to branch out and talk to our neighbors and our rancher friends and everybody. So we brought, get everybody in. It's the soil and the grass. It's this location is what makes them awesome. That's our mission is just to meet with these ranchers, go to their property, RFID chip these ears of these cows to trace them back to the home ranch. It's like the orchard cow prosciutto or sassina I showed you. To have a portfolio in five years of orchard ranch, Carter country ranch, you know, wit ranch, whatever ranch it may be that we're buying from, um, how many year old their cattle is, with pictures, identifying, and notes, and all these things that really profile this older beef in Wyoming. Because that's, um, I think, where the difference is, is that we have the land to do it, we have the resources to do it, and we have the hardworking people to do it. So we've just been kind of developing that program and, you know, it's working. Clean it up. 
As niche market producers broaden their distribution, there's an emerging technology that could strengthen transparency for the customer. It's called blockchain. Talking about blockchain technology and, and what that brings to the table for the state of Wyoming, the, the immediate uh, go-to um, is traceability, right? So blockchain is a distributed ledger. Back in the day, you know, all it was was an affidavit. You're like, is this animal grass-fed? You bet. Here you go. Well, as this thing, there's traceability, all mm -hmm. the, and it's a lot. There's not, you know, it's not so much of a paper trail to try track down. There's actually, you know, computerized, so you have access, a lot easier access to it. So you can have that agent source verification uh, that's USDA certified. Um, but on top of that, you can prove natural. You can prove non-hormone. Um, on down the line. And then you'll be able to take your phone, scan a QR code on that steak, and it'll take you back to show you exactly what, where that animal was from, her age, any pertinent information, her shots, like whatever. It probably wouldn't surprise you to learn then that the big packers are not interested in doing this. You cannot do it in a big plant because it's too chaotic. If you're doing hundreds or even thousands ahead a day, there's no way, but if you're doing one at a time. Some of the medium to small packers are very interested, and it is, it is a possibility at, at, at this time for them to do it. And what the dream is, is that somebody in LA could go to the meat counter and click their phone on a piece of meat, and the, and the rancher and his wife and his dog will pop up, you know, and, and, and the story. And people want that, that's what they want. They want that connection. Pretty amazing to think about, you know, it's like, you know, it's the game's the game's changing. This episode of Farm to Fork Wyoming is available. Order online at shop.wyomingpbs.org. This program was produced by Wyoming PBS, which is solely responsible for its content. To learn more and watch Wyoming PBS programs online, visit us at wyomingpbs.org.